So we are doing high yield endocrinology and it will be a very rapid crux review. So if you want detailed like endocrinology, you should refer to another video. So first is the thyroid gland. If you find an incidental thyroid nodule, what to do? There are two things that you need to worry or do. One is the TSH level. Second is the ultrasound. So the TSH level will help us determine whether it's functional or non-functional. Usually the non-functional ones are more malignant and we will talk about it later, but the functional ones, functional means high thyroid hormone. So you need to do a radio iodine uptake. What will that tell you? It will tell you whether the thyroid is actively producing thyroid hormone, whether it's really functional or it's just like leaking thyroid hormone because of inflammation. The true thyroid uh, in radio iodine uptake, it can diffusely uptake high. It's called Graves disease. There can be a single like toxic adenoma, which is producing high hormone, or there can be multiple like toxic nodules producing high thyroid hormone, which is also known as Plummer's disease. The second issue where there is high thyroid, but radio iodine uptake is not there. This happens in inflammation leaky thyroid or bursted thyroid it can cause that inflammation inflammation either due to pregnancy that is postpartum thyroiditis second due to infection which is subacute thyroiditis or dq brain thyroiditis and the third hashimoto thyroiditis which is like a lymphocytic autoimmune thyroiditis so um in dq brain it is an infection an infection is a pain in the thyroid and for pain what do you usually prescribe NSAIDs or aspirin so NSAID or aspirin is the treatment for subacute dequirane in which you will have a sore throat followed by high thyroid hormone level which will resolve and next Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, in Hashimoto there is a lymphocyte attack on the thyroid it's also called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis so there is a phase of like bursty leaky thyroid hormone and uh, in Hashimoto's you have to remember that it might be associated with other autoimmune diseases as well and the other thing in Hashimoto is that it might be associated with lymphomas uh, so that is a common question. Now getting back to a thyroid nodule. So you have done the TSH level. The second thing that you have to do is ultrasound. And an ultrasound you can see the size of the thyroid nodule. And second is the clinical features like it's multi-loculated and uh, cystic. Uh, all the signs for malignancy so if there are like suspicion for malignancy or the size is greater than one centimeter then what do you do next it's like um, then you have to do fine needle aspiration but if the size is less than one centimeter then you can follow up uh, via ultrasound every like six to twelve months so in some states like pregnancy and increased estrogen because of ocps the thyroid binding uh, globulin it increases so there is less free thyroid and more bound thyroid in those cases uh the normal human body will compensate but if a patient already has hypothyroidism the thyroid level decreases and body cannot compensate you might need to go up on levothyroxine in these patients um the next thing is medullary thyroid cancer so medullary parafollicular c cells they produce calcitonin calcitonin tones down the calcium brings the calcium down and uh, for medullary thyroid cancer you have to do surgery but uh, there is a big but in that because medullary thyroid cancer are mostly associated with pheochromocytoma men 2a and men 2b so men 1 is ppp men 2a is ppm and men 2b is pmm uh, men 1a is ppp which are equally divided so pituitary tumors and then hyperparathyroidism parathyroid and then pancreas uh, insulinomas glucagonomas and all that uh, men 2a has ppm so pheochromocytoma and medullary thyroid cancer the two things that we are worried about are present in both men 2a and men 2b the other p in uh, 2a is uh, um 
hyper para thyroidism and uh, in men to b the other m is morphinoid features or mucosal ganglionomas so if a medullary thyroid patient, a cancer patient needs surgery and uh, we have to screen for pheochromocytoma, how do we screen for pheochromocytoma is urine metanephrins. And why is that important? Because uh, if a patient has like hypertension uh, during surgery because of the pheochromocytoma increased epinephrins, uh, uh, you should not give like beta blocker because it will lead to increased activation of alpha so in few chromocytoma you have to do alpha blockade followed by beta blockade that's why that is important so it seems like we are on the adrenal gland uh the outside layer gfr glomerulosa data and reticularis uh salt sugar and sex uh adrenal there are just two things adrenal uh hyperproduction or low insufficiency so hyperproduction means increased cortisol cushy cushy in my bathroom so i always remember that in my bathroom i at late night i brush my teeth i pee and then i wrap myself inside the bed and go to sleep so you have to do a late night salivary cortisol level um 24-hour urinary cortisol level or go to sleep, suppress yourself, take some of this on suppression test uh, and you need either two of these three to diagnose uh, excess cortisol, cushy Cushing syndrome and uh, in Cushing syndrome, you know, like at night time, I'm not looking pretty like right now I have moon faces, uh, but fellow hump is not right now but it's coming and you are more prone at this time to infection and uh, bruising uh, skin changes ulceration um necrosis of the bones like the femur osteoporosis and blah 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 so these are the symptoms of cushing disease and once you have diagnosed you want to know whether it's primary primary is always related to the gland so adrenal is acting wonky and producing high cortisol or it's the brain acth which is making it produce high so what do you have to do measure the acth man and if the acth is low then it's just the adrenals if it's high then uh, something is wrong with your brain or someplace else so someplace else means uh, lung paraneoplastic syndrome or somewhere else paraneoplastic syndrome so you have to uh, see whether it's really the brain you can do it by high dose dexamethasone suppression test because your brain is still brain it will detect like high eight milligram of dexamethasone and will shut down a little bit or you can also do inferior petrosal sampling for that uh yeah and if it was in the adrenals uh what would you do um because you want for the treatment you want to know whether it's just one side adrenal or both side you would do imaging and if you see it's just one side do surgery but if it's bilateral me medication treatment is needed then next thing is adrenal insufficiency the most common cause of adrenal insufficiency is autoimmune addison's disease and how do you diagnose adrenal insufficiency again measure the cortisol so you can measure the cortisol at any time and uh, if it is less than three it's diagnostic nothing else is required but if it's between three to twenty then you need to do a uh, acth stimulation test um and uh, if the stimulation test, uh, like if you gave, gave some ACTH and were able to increase the cortisol, then uh, that means that uh, uh, there is no insufficiency. Yeah. Uh, there is just one more thing that I wanted to talk about in insufficiency, because if like in primary adrenal insufficiency, uh, 
there will be high ACTH, right? Uh, and ACTH, uh, the protein, it comes in a chain with melanocyte stimulating factor as well. So you can get like hyperpigmentation. And as I said, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's, so other autoimmune diseases are also common. And sometimes uh, in Addison's, like, uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency it's not just cortisol so mineralocorticoids can also be less in Cushing so you can also get uh, if less mineralocorticoids sodium will be less potassium will be high and I associate potassium and hydrogen they go in the same level so you can get metabolic acidosis as well just few more things about adrenal just baby things uh, like if you have hypertension with hypernatremia and hypokalemia uh, it suggests uh, like increased activation of the RAS system, but you don't know whether it's renin or aldosterone. So in this condition, you have to do renin by aldosterone ratio. Uh, if aldosterone is high, then it's consyndrome. And if renin is high, it's either like atherosclerosis, renal artery stenosis in old age or fibromuscular dysplasia in young people. And uh, how do you treat it? So for treating it, you do like mineralocorticoid antagonist, spironolactone or epilirron, or you do sodium channel inhibitors, which is amyloride and triamterene. Um, then uh, next is uh, there are some syndromes like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is 17 hydroxylase deficiency. So one means positive. And uh, like the first one means uh, aldosterone and the second one means androgen. Obviously, aldosterone is above in the adrenals, whereas testosterone is down bottom androgen. So one one alpha hydroxylase, one is positive for hypertension, another one for androgen. So high uh, hypertension plus uh, increased androgens. So 17 would be high hypertension, but no decrease androgens. And 21 hydroxylase, which is the most common, would be uh, no hypertension, no aldosterone, but one is positive. So it means high androgen. So 21 hydroxylase, uh, they can also ask that during puberty, only you will get to know these androgen-like symptoms. So it's diagnosed near puberty. Next is pituitary. In pituitary, if you have acromegaly, what uh, what test do you do? You do a IGF-1 level, which is more reliable than growth factor. Uh, IGF-1 is a protein produced by liver stimulated by the growth factor, which is a reliable indicator or diagnosis for acromegaly. Then uh, the first line treatment for SIADH is water restriction. Um, in pituitary tumors, uh, with prolactin tumors, you have to rule out medication induced. Uh, and uh, first line treatment of prolactinomas is not surgery, it's capergolin. And for pituitary macroadenomas, you follow up every six months. For microadenomas, you follow up every 12 months. Uh, then next would be diabetes mellitus for diabetes or pancreas for diabetes three diagnosis either two fasting uh, levels greater than 200 greater than 126 or one random greater than 200 plus symptoms of diabetes or the HbA1c greater than 6.4 uh, the first line treatment obviously for diabetes is still metformin and metformin cannot be given in a heart disease uh, or uh, CKD especially creatinine greater than 1.5 it causes lactic acidosis and metformin works by three main mechanism decrease uh, increasing insulin secretion, decreasing absorption of glucose via the gut, and decreasing production of glucose, which is gluconeogenesis. Um, and uh, then uh, metformin should always be avoided in hospitalized patients, always switch to insulin. Also, one more thing that people ask is uh, um, most common cause of death in diabetes is MI. Uh, diabetes complication type 1 can cause DK, diabetic ketoacidosis, the other is hyperosmolar 
state and both of them have different so hyper or smaller is mainly glucose so glucose is in thousands whereas in dka glucose is usually in 300 400 but the major difference is dka keto acidosis so you have uh, an iron gap metabolic acidosis an iron gap usually greater than 14 and um, also ketones in the urine and ph is less than uh, 7.3 also you have small breathing which is labored deep tachypnea the treatment for dk is obviously uh fluid insulin plus you also have to give potassium because insulin means potassium in in uh, so potassium is there but it goes inside the cells whereas in hyper or smaller you only have to give insulin plus uh fluids uh, then we have uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Zollinger Ellison syndrome is gastric tumor. Um, it's uh, in the duodenum and uh, gastrin is high. You get diarrhea. Uh, it's uh, diagnosed by gastrin level, which is greater than thousands. And uh, then you go do secretin challenge test. Secretin usually decreases gastrin, but here it's not able to decrease gastrin. Next is glucuronoma. In glucuronoma, you get hyperglycemia. And the other thing is necrotizing migratory arrhythmia. It's a very typical rash for glucuronoma and diagnostic. Yeah, so that was a rapid endocrinology review. Hope you liked it.